Welcome to this week at Mountain View. We are in a series entitled, A Little Help for My Friends. And this week we are talking about anxiety and worry. How does the gospel help us address worry and anxiety? It is human nature. Uh, it is human nature to want to be in control, uh, to want to be able to handle everything, to manage everything. It is human nature to want to be in control. In fact, if you think about it, very few of us, if, if any of us, really enjoy being out of control. The people that we know who enjoy being out of control, we like to avoid those people. Uh, those are the dangerous people. Those are the ones that, uh, that we want to avoid. We don't like to find somebody coming down the road uh, who is out of control. Uh, we try to avoid people who are out of control. Life is usually okay uh, when we try to be in control, if we're trying to handle something that is within our control. But every now and then, we land on something that's out of our control. And if it's just one thing, uh, we do our best, we kind of suck it up, we, we muddle our way through that one thing. But what do you do if you have two or three or ten things that are out of your control? What if they all come at you at the, the same time? But what if they all happen in the same season of life? What we're going to look at this week is how to deal with anxiety and worry. To make things worse, here's what happens. We live in a culture where our, we live in a culture that we suffer from information overload, where things come at us fast, it comes at us hard, and we live in a culture where we have 24-hour news cycles that never stop, they never sleep. We have social media feeds that just go on and on and on, and we can scroll on and on and on. We live in a culture where we are bombarded with information. We're bombarded with information. It seems like it never stops. And then we begin to wonder, what is the future going to be like? What's the future going to be like? When will things be, be normal again? Is this, is this the new normal? Is, is this the way that things are going to be from here on out? As we look at the last five to six months of 2020, and we look at everything that we've experienced, you might be wondering, what will the future look like? Is there ever going to be a time when we get back to normal, or is normal different? And when we talk about as Christians, how do we handle worry and anxiety? The real question is, how does the gospel address our anxiety and our worry? So here's the main thing that I want us to focus on and to talk about this weekend. I want us to look at this one main thing, and here it is, that when we declare our dependence on God, that when we declare our dependence on God, that He has promised to hear our anxieties. That when we declare our dependence on God, He has promised to hear our anxieties. Our main passage for, for this message is found in 1 Peter chapter 5. Is there something that's happening on... So we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5 over the weekend, and so hopefully you can hear a little better now, and not the occasional, you know, I don't know if that was the voice of God, the crackle of God, what that might have, uh, might have been, but we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5 this weekend. And when you think about Peter, the apostle Peter, uh, he really is an unlikely person to, to lecture the church about anxiety and worry. When you look at Peter in the Gospels, the biographies of Jesus, uh, what we find, for example, when Jesus comes walking on the water, Peter jumps out of the boat, and, and as soon as the waves and the wind kick up, he begins to worry and he begins to drown. Now, to be fair, you know, and, and to be fair to Peter, I would have been worrying about jumping out of the boat to begin with, but Peter jumps out of the boat, and, and he begins to worry when the winds and the waves come. There's one time when Jesus is telling his friends that he is going to be betrayed, handed over to the authorities, and killed. And Peter worries that, that Jesus is misguided. And so he takes Jesus aside and he tells him that, Jesus, this is never going to happen to you. And then Jesus rebukes him. 
There's the time in the Garden of Gethsemane when, when the soldiers are coming to arrest Jesus. And Peter panics. And he panics and he draws out his sword and he cuts off a guy's ear. Jesus puts it back on. But when you think about Peter, who you read about in the Gospels, he, he doesn't seem like a very likely person to be telling the church how to handle anxiety and worry. So what happens? What, what changes in the life of Peter? It's simple. Jesus is arrested in the garden, and then he's taken off to a trial, and he's crucified. And three days later, Jesus comes back to life. And from that point forward, Peter is a new person. And so Peter writes in 1 Peter about how the church handles worry and anxiety. And what he's going to do in 1 Peter chapter 5 is he's going to draw a direct connection between our dependence on God and how we handle anxiety. A connection between how we lean on God and how we handle anxiety. Let's start in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on God, because he cares for you. In this passage, Peter mentions three key words, and I'd like to look at them just one at a time. The first one he talks about is pride, then he talks about humility, and finally he talks about casting. He talks about pride. What is pride? Pride in this sense is when we want to take the place of God. Pride is when we want to take the place of God. Peter isn't talking about wanting to do a good job. In other words, how we sometimes talk about, about taking pride in our work. He's not talking about wanting to do you know, a mediocre job, an average job. He's not talking about wanting to do a good job. What he's talking about is wanting to be in charge. This problem of pride begins in the Garden of Eden. It begins with Adam and Eve. And it's been a problem that the human race has dealt with ever since. When Peter talks about pride, he's talking about the danger of pride. He says, in fact, God opposes the proud. That literally means God goes to war against the proud. Pride is dangerous. In fact, in, in many respects, pride, pride may be more dangerous than the coronavirus. Because pride will set us against God. It will give us the illusion that we are in control. Sometimes in the last few months, I've met people who are, are prideful about wearing a mask. And I've met people who are prideful that they don't wear a mask. Peter says the bottom line is don't be prideful. He says don't be prideful because pride keeps you from depending on God. Pride by its very nature convinces us that we are in charge. The second thing that Peter talks about, the antidote to pride is humility. And humility is having a right understanding of who God is and who you are. To put it simply, and perhaps you've heard it put this way, God is God and you are not. That humility is having this right understanding of God and yourself. When you think about it, what does pride, what does pride emphasize? Pride emphasizes self-sufficiency. Pride tells you, you've got this, you can handle this, you know, you're old enough, you're smart enough. You know, pride says you shouldn't be worried about this. Pride emphasizes self-sufficiency. The message of the gospel is that only Jesus is self-sufficient. Only Jesus is self-sufficient. A long time ago, back in the 1600s, there was an English pastor. He was a Puritan pastor. His name was Thomas Watson, which I find kind of funny because Thomas Watson also founded IBM. So not the same guy. So this is a fellow back in the 1600s. And Thomas Watson, the English Puritan pastor, he one time wrote these words. He wrote, till we are poor in spirit, we are not capable of receiving grace. Grace. 
He who is swollen with an opinion of self-excellency and self-sufficiency is not fit for Christ. He is full already. If the hand be full of pebbles, it cannot receive gold. Do you know some people who are holding on to their pebbles? Prideful people hold on to their pebbles. Humble people learn to cast their cares on God. So Peter talks about pride. He talks about humility. And he talks about casting. When he talks about casting, he says, cast your cares on God. And I'd like to add, casting your cares on God takes practice. Casting your cares on God takes practice. When you think about how we often use the word cast or casting, uh, we often use it in the sense of a fisherman. You know, so we, we cast our line, we cast our nets. I am not a fisherman. I eat fish, you know, so I, I really like to eat fish. I, I fished one time, I think, when I was a kid. Uh, I was maybe in, in middle, you know, maybe like middle elementary, fourth, fifth grade. Thanks be to God, I did not hurt anybody. You know, so, so I'm just really grateful that that was a, a, a safe experience. But when you talk about casting your fish, casting your fishing pole, your fishing line, it takes practice. That, that first time you go out and, and you're trying to throw your, your line, trying to cast your line, you have kind of a spot where you want to cast it. And then you throw it like 20 feet, you know, the other direction, you miss all together. It, it gets tangled up in the tree behind you. Uh, that, that learning to cast your line takes practice. You have to go out and practice. You have to go out and practice. You have to do it again. And what Peter's talking about, when Peter says, cast all your cares on God because he cares for you, that takes practice because that does not come natural. None of us are just born natural casters when it comes to to casting our care on God. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We're born with this sense that, that we can do this, we can handle this. I don't need to ask anybody to help. I can do this. And what Peter says is that if you're going to learn to cast your cares on God, that it takes practice. And here's what I've discovered. I have to unlearn some bad habits. I have to unlearn some, some negative ways of thinking, some old ways of thinking. And Peter says you have to learn some, some new ones. What the Bible talks about when it talks about repentance is a great word. Because repentance basically says, if you don't like the direction you're going in life, you don't have to keep going that direction. You don't have to keep heading down the same path that you can literally make a change. And Peter says that we learn to cast our cares on God. That takes practice. We have to overcome our human nature through the power of the Holy Spirit, through godly advice, through the word. And we have to learn how to cast our cares on God. But let me ask you a question. When anxiety creeps in, when, when you find yourself getting, getting worried, getting, getting nervous, do you cast your cares on God? Or do you post on Facebook? You know, do, do, you, do you send out a tweet? You know, do you, do you post something on social media? Who, who do you turn to first when you start to feel yourself getting anxious? Peter says, humble people, they cast their anxieties on God. The prideful people, they don't. They try to bear it themselves. They try to carry their load. And if it's something that they can manage, if it's something that you can handle, then you might be okay. Until you have that day, you have that week, when you have two or three things, four things, ten things that, that you can't handle. Peter says, cast all your cares on God because he cares for you. While it's true that, that God cares about our well-being, he is certainly by, by no means the only one. God is not the only spiritual entity that cares about your well-being. In fact, notice what Peter writes next in verse 8. He says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Resist him standing firm in the faith. He says, be alert. In other words, don't fall asleep. You know, quit, no, don't stop paying attention. Be alert. Be a sober mind because you have an enemy. 
We don't talk a lot in our, our modern culture about spiritual warfare or about having a, a spiritual adversary. But, but Peter is clear. The devil is not your friend. He's not your friend. He, he may come at you like a friend. He may appear like a friend. But he really is, according to Peter, he, he's like a roaring lion. He's like a roaring lion that, that hasn't been fed in a while, who's still a little bit, a little bit hungry. And, and he's looking for something to devour. He's actually looking for someone to devour. And the devil is prowling around, just waiting for that moment. If you were to think about your own life and think about the, the times in your life when you have been most susceptible to the attacks of the devil, when have you been most, most vulnerable? Here's my hunch. At least one of those times, if not most of those times, have been when we have allowed anxiety to creep in. And we take our eyes off of God, and we put our eyes onto ourselves, and we begin to think, I can't handle this. There's no hope. There's no way out. And we begin to try to manage it ourselves. And here's what I've discovered. When I allow my uncertainties, which may be reasonable, to become unreasonable anxieties, I tend to make really bad choices. Because most often, when my, my uncertainty has grown to anxiety, I've taken my eyes off of God. And instead of operating in God's power, I'm doing the best that I can. Instead of relying on God, I'm operating in my own wisdom. And I usually make bad decisions. Peter says, God is interested in your well-being. God cares about you. But there's someone else who's interested too. And that's the devil. And then there's those times when we begin to think that, that you know, things are just really hard. Life's really tough right now. It, you know, things, you know, the devil's just throwing everything he has against me. So I must have the devil's undivided attention. I, I must be the, the only person that he's focused on. Well, notice what Peter tells us in verse 9. He says, you need to stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Have you ever heard the phrase, misery loves company? It's true. You know, you know, misery loves company. But what Peter's not telling us, you know, he's not telling this so that we can all just kind of sit around and, and have a pity party together. What he's telling us is you are not the only one who's facing opposition. In fact, you're not the only one who's suffering. He says, don't you know that the family of believers throughout the world, at any given time, any given moment, there's at least one that's facing suffering. Notice verse 10. And the God of all grace, who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will he himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To God be the power forever and ever. Amen. So Peter tells us that this process of learning how to depend on God, uh, learning how to cast our cares on God, uh, that it takes humility, not pride. Because in our pride, we try to handle. In our humility, we hand over. He says in our, our this process of learning, we have to remember that we have an adversary. And this adversary is active, but he's not just targeting you. He's targeting all believers. And then he gets to the end of this passage, and he offers what the gospel promises. And he says there's several things that the gospel promises. The first thing that the gospel promises is that you are not alone. The gospel promises that you are not alone. Many times, uh, what, what the adversary begins to, to try to plant in our mind is that nobody else understands what you're going through. N nobody else has, has, has experienced this. You're the only one. You're the first one. And, and sometimes we actually believe that. You know, we actually believe, well, there's nobody who can understand what I'm going through right now. And what the gospel says is you're not the only one. That there's a family of believers scattered across the globe, and at any given time, they're facing very similar challenges. 
But the devil wants you to believe you're isolated, you're lonely, you're the only one. And the gospel says you're not alone. The second promise that the gospel makes is that what we face is temporary. In fact, Peter uses language. He says that, that don't you understand that this is only going to be for a little while. He says, after you have suffered for a little while, then God himself will restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. He says, but it's only for a little while. Now, I, I have to be honest with you. I don't understand God's time. You know, how God counts time, how he tracks time. You know, I'm pretty sure God doesn't wear a watch. You know, he doesn't have alerts, doesn't need a, an alarm clock. You know, so I'm not real clear, you know, on how God tracks time. But because God exists outside of time. God is eternal. We are, are temporary. We're kind of finite people. You know, we have a, a limited lifespan. God's eternal. And then you read passages like in the Old Testament that a day is like a thousand years for God. And a thousand years, that's like a day for God. And, and you begin to wonder, how does God count time? How does he track time? So, so when Peter says, after you have suffered a little while, does that mean just a few minutes? Is that maybe a really bad day? Is that just, you know, maybe a stretch, a season, you know, a bad month? Maybe it's a year. I don't know. I don't know that in God's sense of time, that God tracks and measures and thinks of time the same way that we do. I would love to be able to tell you that that temporary means 30 seconds or or 30 days. But what he's saying is it doesn't last forever. In fact, in the larger scheme of things, our life, whether we live, you know, 50 years, 70 years, 75 years, 85 years, in the larger scheme of things, that's small compared to eternity. The gospel promises that, that our sufferings, what we face in this life, they're temporary. And then the third promise is that God himself will restore you. That, that God's not going to delegate the process of making you strong, firm, and steadfast. That, that God himself will do that. That after we have suffered for a little while, after we've been pressed and challenged, that it's God himself who restores you. That word restore, it's important. Because when you restore something, you bring it back to what it was intended to be. And when you think about anxieties and worries and you think about how they affect our lives, that was never the way God intended. God never designed Adam and Eve to be people who worried. That was a result of the fall. And then when God steps in to restore, he's bringing us back to how he always wanted us to be. And he brings us back to being strong, firm, and steadfast. According to Peter, that's why we can say to God be the power, to God be the glory, now and forever. Amen. So what does the gospel say about anxiety? It says that when we learn to depend on God, that God has promised to bear our anxieties. I would like to lead us in a time of prayer. I know over the last several months, beginning perhaps in March, uh, whenever you really began to feel the weight uh, of quarantine, of isolation, perhaps uncertainty regarding your job, maybe health concerns, I, I want to pray. Because I know that, that any time that we have gather together, whether you're, you're worshiping in person or worshiping online, no matter where you might be, that at any given time, in any given person's life, there's uncertainty. There's things we don't know about the future. We don't know how the next step is going to be next day. And so we may be worried. And so I want to pray. I, I don't know what your anxieties might be. I, I can't necessarily name your worries. I think there are some that are common. But I want to just take a moment as we close this part of our service. And I want to pray specifically for you and for how the gospel addresses your worry and your anxiety. And pray that you are able to hand that over to God, that, that the weight that you're bearing by bearing your own worry and your anxiety, 
that you were never designed, never built to handle that. And that God's shoulders are big and broad and strong. And when we hand them over to God, he lifts us up with his mighty hand. So let's pray.